Virginia's rural eastern shore was the victim of serial arsonists for five months during the winter and spring of 2012 and 2013. 67 abandoned buildings were lit on fire by Charlie Smith and his girlfriend, Tanya Bundick. The hunt captivated the county, the state, and made national news. Monica Hesse's book, American Fire, tells that story and so much more. It's a, it is a nuanced look at the rural economic decline, the twisted love affair between Charlie and Tanya, which led to this Bonnie and Clyde crime spree, and the lives of the dozens of volunteer firefighters that went out night after night to battle the blazes that were mystifying and frustrating everyone. The book is captivating from the fire on the first page, switching between the firefights, the police hunt, and the backstory of the arsonists. As one reviewer states, it is a true crime saga that works in every respect. And it is a story about how far, how far one would go for the person one loves. Monica will be joined in conversation by Dan Zack, a fellow reporter at the Washington Post and recent author of the book Almight Almighty, detailing America's history and obsession with the atomic bomb. So please join me in welcoming Monica Hesse and Dan Zack to Politics and Prose. Hi, Monica. Hi, Dan. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Dan Zack. I'm uh, uh, a reporter of, with the Washington Post, like Monica. We sit four and a half feet from each other. So this is actually very familiar territory, <laughs> it, except at work, it's like there's a little kind of transom and a computer, and it's more like this. This is what we see of each other. Like Do that. you want to get coffee? Yeah, exa it's exa <laughs> that's exactly it. Um, so it, it's, I'm very pleased to be here um, because I'm, because of that proximity, uh, I am witness most days to the flashes of brilliance that define uh, Monica's reporting and writing. I can kind of hear it happen across the transom. So I'm glad to be here with all of you to talk about those flashes of brilliance uh, publicly. Um, uh, Monica has written an amazing book. It's a book unlike anything you've ever read. Um, it could only have been written by a writer who has mastered uh, all of the elemental skills of journalism um, from something as basic but frustrating as pulling court documents and 911 calls to the more mystical enterprise of ascertaining matters of the heart, uh, particularly from people who do not want to divulge them. Um, uh, so I, I can't say enough about this book, and obviously I'm biased uh, uh, toward Monica, so I, I do want to read a little bit more of the reviews which have just come out, um, and they can kind of speak for me. Uh, the New York Times may be failing, but they, are, they got the review of Monica's book exactly right. Um, and so I, I hope she will indulge me and you will indulge me from readings from some of that. Um, this book is her, this is Jennifer Senior in the New York Times. This book is her oh God, why did I ask him to do this? <laughs> I can't help it. I'm like a proud younger brother. Uh, this book is her literary nonfiction debut and it's clear that she has talent to burn. American Fire is an excellent summer vacation companion. It has all the elements of a lively crime procedural, courtroom drama, forensic trivia, toothsome gossip, vexed sex. Uh, she also superbly conveys the folkways of the Eastern Shore and the disruptive, confusing effect the fires had on its community. Hesse is a lovely stylist. She has a flair for creating a sense of place. I am now invested in Hesse's career. Uh, and one more, I have to read the Washington Post, the end of the Washington Post review, which, which ends with a breathtaking literary comparison. Uh, there are echoes here of Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, but for all that book's majesty and daring, something clinical and superior hovers over its prose. Hesse, using a similar reporting style, may tell a much more human story. I mean, that's fabulous and gets it exactly right. Um, and uh, we're going to have a Q&A afterward, and I only have a couple of questions. Um, but I want to ask you about three things. Uh, the place, uh, the people involved, and the crime itself. Can you tell uh, us a little bit about Accomack County, the place where the book takes place? Yes, I can. For, first, though, I will say thank you for coming. And two other important things. Um, I woke up with a terrible cold this morning. That's what this is for. And two, my mother, who came in in order to make me feel better from the cold, bought me this strange herbal remedy bath um, made of echinacea leaves. And they st stuck everywhere to my skin. And I thought I got them off. But as I was walking out, I found another like, large leaf stuck to my <laughs> chest. So I'm not actually sprouting. And 
<laughs> if you see something, if you see something, say something. Um, so, uh, hi. Um, Accomack County. Accomack County. Um, so I had heard I had heard of these fires where we live. The fi these fires sort of reach the periphery of our news. I knew that there were fires going on. Ever so often, there would be a paragraph or so, um, an, an AP brief or something like that. Um, and and when the when the arsonists were caught, that's when I started becoming really interested in the fires. And when I went down to cover the first the first hearing for the arsonists, that's when I became really interested in the county. Um, the thing about Accomac is that. The reason that there were 67 buildings to be burned down, and actually it was more like 85, he, he was just charged with 67, was because 100 years ago, Accomack County was the wealthiest rural county in the entire United States. Um, it, it was doing more agriculture than anywhere in the Midwest, than anywhere in Los Angeles. A train ran through it. It was, it was a boom town. And then what happened to it is what happened to, um, to a, a lot of rural places. The railroad went away. Uh, farming styles changed. You no longer needed migrant labor camps because they stopped growing tomatoes, which need to be picked by hand, and they started growing corn, which can just be plowed over with machinery. Um, and so, so people moved, and the county dissipated. And so you were left with this, with this place that had layers and layers of, of history that was now fading a little bit and, and had just become a place of abandoned buildings dotting the side of the road, and then they started to burn. Uh, but it's also, in some ways, a place of still of great beauty, right? I mean, can you describe kind of the natural setting of this county as well? Yeah, so most of you who have heard of Accomac, if you have, um, you've heard of Chincoteague Island, where, um, where the wild horses run. And so most folks, when they go to Accomack County, they, they drive down Route 13, and then just as they hit the border, they hang a sharp left, and, and you drive a bit, and you're on Chincoteague, and you're in a land of Dairy Queens and Hampton Inns and swimming horses and everything that you would want on a vacation. If you drive straight through Accomack, though, then, then you're in a land of... Um, you know, you're in a, a, this low, flat land where you can see the horizon on all ends, and you drive miles and miles between stop signs. Um, at, at night, the roads are, are pitch dark. Um, as my husband will tell you, he, when he dropped me off to go live there for a few months, he deeply feared for my safety, though he didn't tell me until much later. It's, um, it's a place that is, you've never seen a more beautiful place when it's light, and you've never seen a creepier place when it's dark. Um, can I have you read just the first page? Yeah. Um, it kind of uh, uh, supplements the answer to that question. This is uh, okay. from the preface. Okay, this is, this, is, this is the preface. I first drove down to Accomack County, Virginia on Halloween weekend of 2013. There had been a bunch of fires there, two people had been arrested for sending them, and one of those people was now scheduled to submit his plea. At the time, I was in the crappiest place a journalist can be, between stories and out of ideas, and I'd asked my editor to send me to Accomack, mostly because I was looking for an assignment that would get me out of the office for a day. Inside the courthouse, a red brick building that looked like a movie set courthouse on a movie set town square, the defendant in question admitted he was guilty, but didn't say why he'd done it. I spent the next two years trying to understand why he'd done it. The answer, in as much as there is an answer for these kinds of things, involved hope, poverty, pride, Walmart, erectile dysfunction, steakums, the chopped meat sold in the frozen foods aisle, intrigue, and America. America, the way it's disappointing sometimes, the way it's never what it used to be. But it also involved love, the kind of love that's vaguely crazy and then completely crazy and then collapses in on itself in a way that leaves the participants bewildered and telling various different stories about what actually happened. In this instance, the stories shared only one essential truth. When this string of fires began, the defendants were in love. By the time they finished, they weren't. All right, let's talk about love then. Um, Charlie and Tanya are the two, there's many people in this book from the county. Uh, Charlie and Tanya are the two main people. Um, and theirs is the love in question. Um, now, as I was reading it, uh, you know, these are people who are ostensibly responsible for uh, an insane crime spree. Uh, in this county. Um, while the fires didn't injure anyone, they put people's lives at risk, yeah. they wasted uh, a lot of taxpayer money. Um, but I found myself 
liking both of them, and I'm wondering how you, um, uh, what your relate, what kind of your emotional relationship was to them over the course of your reporting and writing, and how you balanced being empathetic with them in their lives and with being kind of a clinical interrogator of their lives. Yeah. So. Um for those of you who haven't read the book, it's not giving away anything to say that the arsonist was, uh, was an auto body worker um, named Charlie Smith, because I think I say that on page 11 or something. Yeah, there's, it's, it's never a whodunit. It's, it's, a, it's a why done it. But um, Char Charlie is a sort of, um, he, he, he's, he's sort of a ne'er-do-well with lovable heart. He, he, had a his, he had a drug problem, he'd been in and out of jail a lot, but um, he was infused with this kind of diarrhea-like honesty, where every time he'd get in trouble, the police would go around and say, Charlie, did you do it? And he'd be like, yep, I did it. You know, like, what, like, what can I say? Um, and he, he was really pure of heart in that way. Um, and, and he fell in love with this woman named Tanya, who, who became his partner in this. And um, I'm really glad you felt empathy for them because I did. And I, I think it came from a place of just wanting to, um, this crime seems so unfathomable and just so weird, just weird that you would get every night in your minivan and be like, which building should we burn down tonight, honey? Um, because that's essentially what was happening. And, and I felt like to, to make this book feel like it was more than um, news of the weird part 732, um, my goal had to be to try to deeply understand what the bizarre five and a half months of the arsons looked like. But that couldn't just be to understand what it looked like if you were a fireman or if you lived in the town. It had to, it had to also be to understand what it looked like and felt like if you were the the people setting these fires. Um, and so I, I don't think I really tried to have empathy or tried to interrogate them, them as much as I was just trying to figure out what would put two people in the mindset of deciding to do this. Right, yeah, and, and you have a whole chapter devoted just to the crime of arson, and in fact, the first sentence of it is, arson is a weird crime. Yeah. Um, it's not something that I knew a lot about, and maybe there's people here who don't know a lot about arson, why people do it, the research and history of it. Is there anything you can tell us about the weirdness of arson and how it relates to kind of the core of this story? I mean, one of the weird things about arson, and I think this is more technical than you were asking, but something I had never thought about, is there, there are crimes that, that are called, um, that are, that are clue-rich crimes. So murder is a very clue-rich crime. There can be fingerprints, there can be bullet casings, there can be blood spatters. There's a lot to point you in the direction of who did it. With arson, the evidence burns to the ground, especially in cases like this, where the buildings that were set on fire were ancient and, and rotting and dry. They, they just disappeared. Um, so, so at the heart of the story, the reason these arsons were able to go on so long is because it is really hard to catch an arsonist. And in fact, something only like 15% of arsonists are ever caught, um, which means that we can, we can study the arsonists we know about, but we actually don't know about most of them. Um, the ones that we do know, it's, it's not, as, as one of the criminal profilers I talked to, um, you're not usually going to see an arsonist who is a scion of industry. Ars arson is a crime of, um, of feeling disempowered and trying to reclaim some of that power. And Charlie and Tanya, by the time they were lighting these fires, um, that was kind of their whole life. And part of the book is trying to explore how they got to that place. Um, you know, we, uh, we cosmopolitan, elitist urbanites have been trying to kind of understand rural America, especially recently with uh, this recent election, with uh, other nonfiction books like Hillbilly Elegy. Uh, and, and I'm wondering uh, what the experience is like kind of going to a place like this. And did you encounter any resistance from people, any suspicion who said, who, who were kind of uh, questioning of someone who was coming in and poking around. Um, and, and either way, how did you kind of navigate and earn the trust? Um, it's really something, I guess, that reporters do no matter what situation. Yeah. But in terms of this specific one, it seemed, from the outside anyway and from reading it, like it must have taken work or been a daunting task. But, but maybe you can kind of describe what that was like. So 
there are a lot of journalists in the room, I think, and, and I think that a lot of you could speak on this better than I could or, or offer your own thoughts. But, um, and, and you know yourself, the, the biggest trick is just not going away ever. Um, you know, I, I, I drove down, and the first night that I drove down, it was like, let's open the penny saver and see what's happening. Oh, like, the Parksley Fire Station is having a, a barbecue fundraiser. Let's go to that and better go to the high school football game tonight and get up in time to go to the Rotary Club's bingo game in the morning and make sure that you, you know, um, you the, the sheriff refused to talk to me for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then about the fourth time that I saw him at the, um, the Friday night football game, because his son was on the team, he was just sort of like, all right, just come by on Monday, because, because he could see I wasn't going, going away. And, and the other thing is that, you know, people are n a lot of people are not listened to a lot. And, and I think it means something if you're able to explain, like, I am deeply interested in your life. Um, you're fixing your car. I want to see how you fix your car. You're going to stay up all night and see if there's a fire. I want to do that, too. Um, I think that as a journalist, you, you can learn to fake a lot of things. You can learn to fake not being shocked when someone says something crazy. Or you can learn to, um, you know, you, you, there are some skills you can learn, but trying to be deeply, being deeply curious is not an easily faked skill. So... How long did you, so you actually lived there. How, for how long were you, you know, living there continuously? I, I, rented a, I rented a house for two months, and then I think I made nine or ten other trips that were just, you know, a day, two, three, four shorter, shorter day trips. And you were actually spending considerable amount of time, among other things, with the fire department, right? Can you describe that experience and the, the kind of parameters of that? Yeah, so the fire department... Um, so, so Charlie, the, the arsonist, had been, uh, had been a volunteer firefighter with TASLI, which is this tiny, um, tiny, crappy, and I'm, I'm saying that in the lovingest possible way. Um, this was a fire station that had been built in 1915 when they had horse-drawn fire carriages instead of, like, m motors and had never been updated since. So it was, it was falling apart. But it was also the company that ended up being called out for more fires than any other place. And, um, and I met one firefighter and, and asked if I could. They happened to be having their, their weekly uh, meeting. And he was like, well, why do you want to come to that? We're just going to talk about, you know, budget, whatever we're going to talk about. I was like, well, great. I think that sounds great. Um, and, and then they just, they just let me they let me stay. They gave me, they gave me a pager so that if they got a fire call, I could hear the pager go and I could go off to the fire. When it became clear that the house that I had rented was too far for me to really get to any fires, they gave me the, the code for the firehouse so I could just let myself in and go sleep on the couch. Um, they were like, have you seen Backdraft and Ladder 49? And I was like, no, let's watch those. Um, and they were... And and they were they they were great. I had I had dinner at their houses, and they helped me fix my car. And it was um, I I could I could not have been more lucky to to fall in with that. And in fact, crew. didn't they vote you in as a support member? Why of the yes, they did. <laughs> my last night in Accomac, they they said they were like, it's our final. It's our it's our, you know, November meeting. And I was like, your November meeting isn't supposed to be till the 12th, Jeff. And he was like, no, come by. It's our meeting. And they, um, it was actually a surprise party so that they could vote me in as an honorary member of the Tasley Fire Department. And I'm actually going to kind of choke it up by this because it was, it was, such, an ama it was such an amazing thing for them to do. Um, you know, you talk about in the preface uh, about America, what it was, what it is. And I think... Uh, any story or most stories that you do, that we do, that any journalist does can somehow fill in um, you know, another sliver in the paint by numbers painting of America. And, uh, and, and I'm wondering if there was anything, if you saw you know, this region, the Mid Atlantic, or the United States in general in a new light, uh, or um, if there was any kind of illumination or revelation about 
the country that went beyond just the one county or just beyond one fire department? Yeah, so first of all, I'm really glad that I, f I finished this manuscript before the 2016 election. Um, and I'm glad that I did that because I feel like after the election there became this compulsion to, to try to understand America in, in, this, in this big sweeping way. And if I had gone into this book trying to do that, it would have just been such a cliche, miserable failure. Um, I feel like with rural America especially, we tend to, we, we the coastal urban elite media, um, I, I, I think it's really easy to do one of two things. I think it's easier, I think it's easy to um, either dismiss it as, you know, the, this, this poverty stricken Appalachia, paint in those broad brush strokes. I think it's also easy to paint in the broad brush strokes of, um, that's that's real America. That's that's the America as it should be, um, and and what I hope that I did in this piece was was tell a really realistic portrait of you can have um, you can have firemen who are kind and will vote in a woman they've never met to be you know the, this honorary member of the team, and 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 those same firemen can you know, uh, say really crass, terrible things to outsiders. Or, um, or you can have, you can have this, this down on his, her luck uh, arsonist who also kind of has the soul of a poet. And we, what's the Walt Whitman line? It's like, we, we are many, we contain multitudes. And so I, I hope that, um, I was actively trying not to tell a broad story of America. I, I hope I told it a, a smaller story that, that ends up being meaningful in its own way. So this is your fourth book mm -hmm. in four years, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, and your first nonfiction book. Um, the three previous were novels. Um, I, you know, I don't know how many people here actually toggle between the two, um, but I'm wondering if you can kind of compare and contrast just your personal uh, process, the similarities between writing fiction and nonfiction, um, and, and also um, any overlap in, in reporting that you do um, yeah. um, for, for both types of writing? Well, the fiction that I do is historical fiction, so I do, I do a lot of research for that. It's not research free. Um, I find nonfiction both more liberating and more terrifying. I find it liberating because you don't have to make up the story. You, you know what happened, and I find that really, I, I find those parameters really reassuring, um, that I don't have to create anything, it's, it's all there. I, I feel like the difference between fiction and nonfiction is that when you're writing fiction, you're like a sculptor and there's a lump of clay that you have to turn into something. When you're writing nonfiction, you're like a stone worker with a lump of granite, and the, th the thing is already there. You just, you just have to find it. Um, but, you know, nonfiction is about real people, and, and I never for a moment forgot that, but there were times when it became especially more poignant, especially as I was getting ready for this book to come out, and I was having people in Accomac write me and be like, when's your book come out again? Can't wait to read it. And I would know that the book had three chapters about them and they were going to read about themselves. Um, and I think all journalists here know that specific and horrific panic feeling that comes with that when you're just thinking, God, I really hope I got it right. Right, and, you, and actually you're headed down there to do a, a, the same type of thing. Like, a re when is that and, and, and where is that exactly? Uh, so I'm going down to Accomac on Saturday um, to the book bin, which is uh, the only bookstore in the county and it's 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 a l sweet, lovely place in a strip mall where I drank a lot of coffee. Um, and, and I have to tell you, I, no offense to anyone in this room, I was not nervous about you guys, but I am, I am terrified. I am terrified about, about them because a lot of people in the book certainly lived through the fires in a way that I never had to. And I guess they'll, they'll be the judges of how they feel I did. Um, I have one last question, then we'll go to audience questions, and, and apologies, but this is kind of an inside baseball process question, but I'm, I'm curious. Um, you know, we, we've worked together on stories before, but I'm, I'm mainly interested in how you work for, uh, for how you worked for this book in terms of, you know, we know you did kind of two um, uh, months together down there reporting kind of in the field. 
but kind of walk us through what you did after that in terms of were you reporting and writing at the same time? Did you kind of finish the reporting and mainly focus on the writing? Kind of take us through your day, uh, you know, when you're totally kind of on book leave in the field and then a day when you're already back and you have to somehow kind of bring everything together. How do you, how do you work? Yeah, so when I, when I was down in Accomack, um, I, I was on a leave from the post. So I, I had a four month leave of absence from my day job. And, and I viewed that leave as this, this is the time to do everything that you cannot do in front of a computer screen. You know, four months from now, you are not going to be able to go to the Parksley Fire Department's barbecue chicken dinner. And so for four months, like that's, that's your job. Your job is to live in this county in as deep a way as you can and to interview all of the people you can, um, and I, I don't know exactly how many people I interviewed. I know it was, I know it was more than 100, and so for, for that portion, that's it. I was able to get most of the reporting done by the time I, by the time I wrote, aside from like, oh, it'd be really useful to have these kinds of statistics in this chapter. Where can I find those kinds of statistics? But the bulk of the reporting I finished when I was on leave, and then when I came back to work, it was just, um, writing, you know, between the hours of 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. or whenever. A certain amount of words per day, or what do you do to kind of have goals? Yeah, I do the same amount of words, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. I do a thousand words. It seems like, it seems like a manageable round number, and uh, when I get to the end of the thousand words, even if I'm in the middle of a sentence, I stop, so that I'm always ending with a lovely zero at the end, a lovely zero, 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 and then I pick up in the middle of the sentence the next the next day. Any questions from the audience? If so, where are the where are the microphones? Or where the oh, there's one right there. Maybe that's the only one oh. right here. Can we? I think this woman was raising her hand first, though. Um, I I read the excerpt of part of your book in the Washington Post, and it seemed to me, didn't they the county bring in a lot of arsonists from across the state? who could really get into the, the into it in a professional way or am i just dreaming about it no so the question was was kind of what assistance the the county had in um in solving these crimes and the term that i heard that i loved from a lot of locals was that um, that Holiday Inn was just an alphabet soup. And they meant it was the alphabet soup because that's where the FBI was, that's where the ATF was, that's where the VSP was, and, and all of the state agencies were, were coming in. At one time, they had, um, they had five uh, psychological profilers. They had uh, state police coming in on rotations from all over the county. By the end of the arsons, they had put in something like 47,000 man hours in investigating. Yeah. Um, and if you have questions, please line up right over here. Yes, sir. Now, you said that you know, only 15% of arsons are uh, solved, and we don't know a whole lot about the arsonists. But are these two, do they kind of match what we know about arsonists in general, or are they something different? You know, it kind of depends on what version of the story you believe. Um, uh, I don't want to give away too too much, but if if you believe one person's story, then um, one of them matches exactly with what you would expect an arsonist to look like, um, down to uh, an interest in fire, a certain level of education, a certain age range, a certain like like paint by numbers, all of that. Um, if you believe the other person's story, then uh, no, neither of them even remotely match. So I think that's the best way to answer. Yes, sir. In terms of the houses, were any of those losses in terms of an historic home or possible historic home, like things like that? So um, there were places that had a lot of history. One of the chapters in the in the book, which was the most exciting for me to write. Uh, back when the shore was in its heyday in the 20s and 30s, uh, there was a big resort built called Whispering Pines, where any time any famous person came through, they would go there to stay and swim and order chicken salad. And, and it was a really sort of a ma majestic place. It had indoor plumbing. That was a, that was a big draw. Um, by the time the arsons came around, that place had been abandoned for, for a good long while, and it, it was not in great shape. Um, and it and it was burned. It, w it was something like the 60th arson. So, 
it it was it was a place with a lot of historic sentimental value, but it had been in disrepair for for really a pretty long time. Will the people get their you know insurance money back? Or? You know, a lot of these places um, weren't even insured. A lot a lot of these places were buildings that you would have had to live in the county for a long time and know exactly what shortcuts and routes to take to even know that they existed, um, which was a, an interesting. Uh, which was a, an interesting grace note to all of the arsons is that they were horrible and they were destructive and they used this manpower and it was exhausting. And then, then at the same time, there were some buildings that burned and, and people said, well, they should have burned that one a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. You know, we mentioned the um, uh, Bonnie and Clyde archetype already, and you mentioned it in the book as well. Um, is, is there any precedence for, for a pair of people, a pair of arsonists, or? I could never find one, and if anyone else can, let me know, because I spent, I spent a long, I spent a long while trying. Because there's certainly a, a long, uh, history of, of, of paired criminals, but just, yeah. but not arsonists. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I would hate, I would hate to say with definitiveness, this, this is the first, you know, married couple that, chose to spice up their life in, in this particular direction, but, but I couldn't find any others. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, I know while this was going on, people in the county, county were quite anxious about the uh, fires, um, but after the people were caught, um, did you interview many locals in terms of whether they were sympathetic at all to the, the two people who committed the arsons and could understand why they did it or or were they kind of hostile to them you know to a certain extent some people were sympathetic to Charlie because a lot of folks knew Charlie and and they just sort of thought of him as like oh oh Charlie I mean that like there's that's the best way to describe people's general sense of of Charles Smith um, but but for the most part no because when they were arrested all they all they knew was um, here are two people who were making us panic and making our lives difficult for five and a half months. Um, and, and, and especially, and you know, with Charlie, you were part of the fire department. You knew, you know what it's like to get up at 2 a.m. and have to go put out a fire. How could you do this to us? We were, we were your friends. Um, but I also think that the, the reasons were so inscrutable at the time and, not that I wrote this book to uh, tell the, you know, not that I wrote this book to engender sympathy for arsonists in general, but, but like I said, I, I did try to really understand why they were doing it. And I don't know, maybe people will feel some sympathy now, or at least understanding. And his wife, or were people more hostile toward her? Yeah, people are always more hostile toward women. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think, you know, it, Tanya is, Tanya is a bit of, she's a hard character, and I, I mean that in a couple of ways. She's hard for me to wrap my brain around. She also is, um, you know, she has prickly edges, and she, she is a, she's a hard person. Um, I think that nobody knew her very well. I think that nobody knew her history very well. And, um, and it was the, the general sense that if Charlie had done it, it must have been Tanya's fault. And did you say her last name was Bunting? Bundick. Oh, Bundick. Okay. Yeah. So when you first got to the story, they, were they both in jail? Or where, I, when you first started reporting, right? Were, were they at, was one of them free and one of them in jail? Or Yeah, so when I first started reporting, so um, when, they, when they caught, y yes. I was, I was going to delve into like a long, convoluted court procedural expectation, uh, explanation that I will not I will not force upon any of you. Yes, for all intents and purposes, they were they were both in prison. So, so my question to you is, how do you uh, how do you interview? How do you report? How do you build these kind of very detailed uh, personality sketches with people who are kind of so removed from, so inaccessible in, in many ways? You know, I I wrote Charlie a really long letter, and it was I mean it was pages and pages long, and it wasn't you know, particularly well ordered. It was, it was just like, hey, I think I'm going to do this book. This is, this is what I'm interested in doing. Like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not promising anything, but, but I'd like to talk to you if you want. 
Um, and then I didn't, I didn't hear from him. And then one day I, I was getting out of the shower and it was, you know, you, you have a collect call from an inmate at Accomack Regional Facility. Um, and it was Charlie. And so I was like running around the house in a towel with a magic marker and a roll of paper towels. And, <laughs> and my, and we, I mean, we talked for two hours. My first conversation with Charlie was, was just notes on a roll of paper towels. And then, and what he said to me at the, at the end of that conversation, after he tried to get a sense of who I was, was um, everybody that I ever knew thinks I'm a bad person. And um, I don't want them to think I'm a bad person. So if I can kind of explain to you what I think happened, like maybe that'd be a good thing. And were you in fairly regular contact with him in some uh, form or fashion after that? or Yeah, he would call a few times a week. And when I went down to Accomac, they had Saturday visiting hours. So I just, I'd go to the jail every Saturday and, you know, chat with him for a half an hour or so. And, um, and after a while, I felt like I had asked him, I talked to him this morning. Um, after a while, I felt like I had asked him everything I could think of to ask about, um, you know, the, the crimes. And I would go in and we just talk about, like he, he was he was really into this reality show about tattoos so i like made sure to watch that and we'd talk about we talk about tattoos we talk about um this country western writer that he liked and you know and tanya was a different story a bit right in terms of yeah so i i interviewed tanya once this this whole story this this book began as a long article in the washington post and i i interviewed her for that article um and then she was never interested in talking to me again so she was harder because she was piecing I, that that meant y you have to work four times as hard because you you don't want it to just be Charlie's story. I wanted her to have as much emotional richness and depth, and I wanted all of that. But that meant you know just having having to do a lot more reporting to find people who had known her. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I know the Eastern Shore of Virginia pretty well, and have lived there, and and have a house there, and have for a long time, and share your sense of the people and from what I've read I've read two or three chapters and from what I see of you tonight I I, I really resonate and appreciate and oh. I think you will be well received at the book bin <laughs> except <laughs> I when I, I read uh, the first review in uh, Garden and Gun yeah. and and I thought why did you use the term hangnail to describe the eastern shore of Virginia that I dare say that that people there will, will jerk at that, and I wondered why you would have chosen it. You know, that was that was honestly, I, in in one of the chapters, I described the 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 ge the geography as the as a hangnail off the coast of Virginia, and for me, it, it purely w was just physically. It is a it is a small, slender sliver that hangs off of this larger body it was not meant to denigrate either the shore or hangnails it, it was just that this this to me is what that strip of land looked I, like I, I guessed as i read that that's, that was the case but i dare say that will that'll hurt oh man <laughs> all right i'm prepared i'm prepared yeah, to at address least you're forewarned now yeah, yeah prepared to address that particular <laughs> aspect of things any other questions for monica okay Um, is it, what, was there any uh, uh, final estimate on financial damages um, caused by the string of arsons, um, whether it's manpower, buildings, what, uh, supplies? Well, I think I said that it was something like um, it was something like forty-five or forty-seven thousand hours of manpower. There was also an estimate of buildings, um, but I I couldn't I can't remember it off the top of my head, and the number would not seem impressive to you, and. Part of the reason it would not seem impressive to you is, for example, Whispering Pines, that lovely, elegant, historic resort that I um, that I mentioned. By the time it was burned down, it was estimated to be valued at only about three hundred thousand um, dollars, because real estate is a lot cheaper there, and because uh, you know it, it was in really a state of disrepair. So, so to to people who live in portions of the country where re our real estate is just astronomically expensive, it won't seem like a lot. But you know, in a place where you can buy a lovely house for eighty thousand dollars, it it's a lot. It's a lot there. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, so I was really interested in what you said in the book about the criminal profilers that were involved yeah. in the case, and particularly the sort of the cliche of an arsonist always being um, the volunteer fire person. Yeah. In the same way that there's sort of a cliche about nurses and 
you know, good nurse type syndrome. Yeah. Um, and I think all of us who've watched CSI think as we're getting ready so for all as of we're us, getting, yeah, yeah, as we're getting ready for the wedding in the hotel room watching CSI, I think I can do that. Um, so I'm just curious about your the experience you have with the profilers and that sort of stereotype of the of the bad fire fireman who becomes the arsonist. So the most fascinating profiler that I talked to was actually um, not a, a he he was a psychologist, um, but he was uh, he he specialized in a kind of profiling that dealt with math and with numbers. So he, his his specialty was taking a lot of crimes and and using the geographic data points of those crimes to um, to, to pinpoint where he thought the criminal lived. Um, at one point, he had done that with enough accuracy that he suggested the police go interview people who lived at a particular intersection, like the intersection of Matthews Rose at Road and uh, Rose Cottage Road, which was, in fact, the intersection of where the arsonists live. Um, the arsonists were interviewed many times, but they were never they were never arrested and they were never suspects. No, nobody was, nobody was ever a suspect. Um, so that was the most interesting profiler that I talked to. Um, in terms of the, 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 the bad firefighter uh, stereotype, um, I, I quote Freud a little bit, but only a little bit because really who, who needs to quote Freud more than that? But I mean, he, he had he had theory he had theories about fire, but he had he had a sort of evocative passage about just how drawn man was to fire, just in in general. And so if if you um, if you're a person who is who is drawn to fire as this breathing pulsing organism, um, I, I would imagine that you're going to be drawn to it whether you're going to go put it out or whether you're going to go start it. And so they are I think they are two sides of the same coin that. Stipulation: The vast majority of firefighters are not and never will be arsonists. But it wasn't just uh, these professionals, both in the county and coming from out the county, d trying to solve this crime spree. The, the county itself, the kind of regular citizens, yeah. were a bit engaged in trying to kind of make the stop or figure out who was doing it without giving too much away from the book. Can you kind of give us an idea of how the county and the little towns within the county actually activated and tried to do something about yeah, it? Yeah, because their buildings were burning down. And so at a certain point, they think, if the police can't solve this, I, I shall solve it myself. Um, and, and, and the way that we deal with a lot of things with kind of macabre humor, there, there were people who kind of dealt with the arsons in a macabre kind of, kind of humorous way, like, uh, you know, betting pools on which town, which town was going to have a house burned down next, or, you know, like, let's put on our camo and go see what we can catch, what we can do. And then four hours later, you realize all you did is drink beer and you're too, you know, you're too drunk to go home. But um, I, I, I was, I was really interested in the ways that m you have the largest crime spree that your county has ever experienced. You, your county is burning down around you. So what does that mean for your for your daily life and the ways that it that it affected and twisted daily life became really interesting to me. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Monica, for writing this book, um, and she will be signing copies of it afterward. <laughs>